Just to give you also how this whole thing works, uh, Bruce is our presenter. He will make his presentation. Uh, once his presentation is done, we'll go to each of the panelists, and in turn, they will make a comment on the book, um, then ask the speaker a question, who will then, in turn, answer. Then it will move to the second panelist. And that can happen a couple times. It'd be nice if there's even general discussion it goes, because the whole idea is to take this into a little bit deeper uh, subject matter. Um, so I think that's most of what uh, you folks like to hear. After they are done and there are no further questions, this will open up to the uh, general public for their questions, for anything that you have that you want to ask on the book of either the panelist or the speaker. I don't know that Dick Summers needs any introduction. Because if I'm going to go over here and talk about, uh, I understand he worked somewhere near here, so most of you probably know him. Um, but he served for 43 years in the uh, U.S. Army Military History Institute here at the Education Center. And I uh, understand he has retired, right? <laughs> As a senior historian of the center in January of 2014. He continues teaching at the U.S. Army War College, writing about the Civil War and speaking to Civil War groups across the nation. He has published over 100 books, articles, chapters, entries, and reviews on the Civil War. Uh, his most recent book, the expanded, revised 150th anniversary edition of Richmond Redeemed, The Siege of Petersburg, was published by Savas Beatty in September of 2014. For those of you who are here, uh, he did a presentation for us uh, on that book. Uh, it was honored by the Army Historical Foundation with a Distinguished Writing Award as the best expanded reprint book of 2014. In May of 2015, he was designated a Distinguished Fellow of the U.S. Army War College, an honor accorded to only 1% of the approximately 3,400 faculty who have taught at that institution since 1950. That's pretty good, Dick. Um, a graduate of Carleton College with a doctorate from Rice University, he was born and raised in suburban Chicagoland, and he and his wife Tracy reside here in Carlisle. So that's one panelist, which our speaker was not quite aware, since they were very good friends, he wasn't quite aware who the panelists were today, and we kind of kept that uh, somewhat of a secret. So there you go, Bruce. Now you know. <laughs> Um, our other panelist is Ted Alexander, is a 36-year veteran of the National Park Service. He spent the last 16 years as the historian at Antietam National Battlefield. Pretty impressive in and of itself. He holds a BA in History and Education from the University of Maryland, College Park, and a Master's in History from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. He is the author, editor, and contributor of 12 books on the Civil War and other aspects of American history. Ted has written more than 200 articles and book reviews for publications such as Civil War Times, Blue and Gray, Civil War News, and the Washington Times. He is a commenter, uh, I'm sorry, he is a commentator on the Emmy Award winning documentary, Heart of the Civil War, which is, uh, airs on Maryland Public Television. Ted is a Marine combat veteran of Vietnam where he served two tours. He's currently working on a book on the retreat from Gettysburg. He has studied the role of Ulrich Dahlgren in the Gettysburg campaign for more than 35 years. So that is our panelists. Our speaker. I've known Bruce for a few years, and uh, Bruce and, and his wife Lynn, raise your hand Lynn, um, phenomenal people. Um, I'm going to make sure I get Bruce's bio right here because I'm going to read that to you, but uh, Bruce also has a company, and it is briefly mentioned in this, but he has America's History LLC. And I've taken several of their bus trips. If you're into history and you're into seeing places that you don't typically get to, this almost sounds like one of your advertisements, <laughs> but uh, if, if you're into that type of thing and you really want a phenomenal bus trip, you ought to take a look at America's History LLC. I've got a couple of his cards up here if anybody wants to take a look at them. Um, we're doing, my wife and I, Valerie, who's here, um, we're doing one in September, looking at another one um, in August. So he has some really phenomenal ones, uh, a lot on Revolutionary War, a lot on Civil War. 
So Bruce is uh, major interest is Civil War Calvary. Actually, I got to know him through Revolutionary War stuff, but he's uh, definitely Civil War Calvary, with an emphasis on the career of Union General Judson Kilpatrick. He frequently lectures on the Calvary and has led bus tours on the Kilpatrick Dahlgren raid and the focus of his book, Kill Jeff Davis. In 2012, he participated in a reenactment of Dahlgren's raid through Goochland County, where he rode with over 80 troopers for three days, serving as their historian. He is a past president of the Richmond Civil War Roundtable and currently serves as first vice president of the Goochland County Historical Society. Two things he hasn't mentioned here is that he's involved with the American Revolution Roundtable and actually helped get this program started here at the War College. Um, Bruce also puts together a Williamsburg Conference on the American Revolution, another phenomenal event. Uh, he has published articles in Blue and Gray, Civil War, Patriots of the American Revolution, Goochland County Historical Society Magazine, Washington Times, and numerous professional journals. He is also the author of The Battle of Hubbardton, the rear guard action that saved America. Fenner spent 36 years in public education before his retirement, mostly as an assistant superintendent in school systems in New York, Virginia, and Maryland. He holds a BA in history from Manhattan College and a master's in public administration and doctorate in educational administration from the University at Albany. Bruce Fenner is president of America's History, a tour and conference company which he founded in 2010. He lives in Goochland County, Virginia with his wife Lynn and their big old Sally. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce them. It's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Bruce Fenner. Thank you very much, Mike. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mark, for that wonderful introduction. Um, it, it's just wonderful to be here today. This is, it's just an honor and a pleasure to be in this venue because it's just a place that I spent a lot of time, not on this campus, but on the other campus at the Military History Institute during all of my research on this book and some other projects that I was working on. And so to come back here and to be able to lecture here in this building is just beyond belief. I just, I'm very, very touched by that. Um, now, Mark mentioned that I wrote another book on the Battle of Hubberton, and I have to tell you quickly that I gave a talk on the Battle of Hubberton to, Ver to the Vermont Historical Society, and it was around this time of year in the summer. On a beautiful day, we had a corporal's guard there. I mean, there was just nobody in the audience. So I am so thrilled that you're all here and coming in uh, from the sun and, and to be here to hear about the Kilpatrick Dahlgren raid. I don't want to forget that. Uh, it's so good to see Ted Alexander. He's been a good friend for many years. And of course, uh, I have to tip my hat to uh, my mentor in many respects, uh, Dr. Summers. Uh, I've known Dr. Summers, I think, since the early 90s when I was going to the Military History Institute. Um, he was a reader of the article that I did for Blue and Gray magazine on the Kilpatrick Dahlgren raid, which was published in 2003. And so when I decided to do a book on this raid, um, and I sent the proposal to the University of Oklahoma, they asked to suggest some readers. And Dick was a reader. Uh, of the manuscript in the first iteration of it, at least the early chapters of it. And then he pulled himself off because he wanted to go republish Richmond Redeemed. And so Oklahoma substituted someone as a reader, and they read the entire manuscript, and they didn't like it, okay? In fact, I can still remember the comment. It said, the the format and structure of this manuscript lends itself to that of a novel or a slick history book published by a New York City publishing company. <laughs> and so, oh, well, so Simon & Schuster would have been interested in it, would have been a bestseller. Uh, but anyway, the, the editor at Oklahoma quickly saw that this was not the person to approve the manuscript, and he made a substitution, and we got somebody else in there, and they signed off on it, and it became 
uh, a book in uh, January of 2016. So things would have been a little bit smoother if Dick had stick or stuck around, but he wanted to get Richmond redeemed out. But okay, now this is the cover of the book. It's been up there for at least a half hour or more, and the idea is twofold. One is because we want you to buy the book. It's out there in a the bookstore. The other is we want you to pay attention to the uh, title of the book. It's Kill Jeff Davis. It's not killing Jeff Davis. I have no affiliation with Bill O'Reilly and whatever he does uh, to promote his book. So it's Kill Jeff Davis. I'm going to start with a discussion of some of the principal characters of this book. Judson Kilpatrick. Judson Kilpatrick is 26 years old in 1864. He is a graduate of West Point, the class of May 1861. He, is, uh, he graduated 17th in a class of 45. He was immediately given a command in the 5th New York Infantry, also called Durye Zouaves. And he was able to do this through some political connections he had cultivated at West Point. See, in addition to being fairly good at his studies, he was also a great orator. And in those days, if you had oratorical skills, you were the valedictorian of your class. So he was the valedictorian in May 1861. And through his skills with politics, uh, he had stumped for his congressman. That's how he got into West Point. He was able to secure this commission through the Davies family. Now, Henry Davies Sr. was a judge in New York City, very influential in New York politics. And he had a son, Henry Jr., who was an attorney, who was also in the 5th New York uh, Infantry with Kilpatrick. And Henry's cousin, J. Mansfield Davies, would be a major in the regiment. And Governor Warren, who was one of Kilpatrick's teachers at West Point, a math teacher, I believe, uh, was lieutenant colonel. So he gets himself into the 5th New York. He is assigned to the peninsula down there. And he, he fights in the Battle of Big Bethel, July 10th, 1861. And he is wounded during the battle in what has been called the upper thigh, right about here. And uh, I know a lot of people like to make fun of that, but I think that uh, he was just turning around and getting his men in position. Anyway, while he is recuperating in New York City, he finds out about a regiment that's to be raised in New York, which will be the second New York Cavalry. In the meantime, right after he graduated from West Point, he married um, Alice Schaller. And this is a a photograph that's in the book, and it's, it's right here at Carlisle. I got it from the Carlisle collection. And um, Kilpatrick hears about this regiment, and through the Davies family again, he is able to secure a position as lieutenant colonel. Henry Davies Jr. will be the major, and J. Mansfield Davies will be the colonel. Very interesting. Some army politics going on here. Now, because Kilpatrick is a, um, is a military man by training, he is going to basically lead the regiment most of the time. J. Mansfield Davies is pretty much uh, a non-entity in the regiment. He'll eventually uh, uh, resign, and Kilpatrick will become colonel of the regiment. Now, he will fight in 1862 with the regiment, and as a colonel, he'll be promoted to being in charge of a brigade. And what's important here is that he will lead a brigade during Stoneman's raid, okay, two, two regiments anyway. And he will be on Stoneman's raid during the Chancellorsville campaign. And that's where Stoneman rode around Lee's army, Army of Northern Virginia, got in back of it, and uh, as Stoneman said, it was like a shell bursting uh, in central Virginia. And so his regiments went in all different directions. Well, Kilpatrick's regiment actually got closer to Richmond than any of the other units that were on that raid. And coincidentally, Lincoln heard about that, and he also heard from an exchanged prisoner, an officer, that Richmond was not very well guarded in May of 1863. And so 
he will, uh, Lincoln will write a letter to Joe Hooker, the commander of the Army of the Potomac at that time. And he writes the letter and it says, there was not a sound pair of legs in Richmond. And had we known it, we could have gone in and grabbed Jeff Davis. Now this is very important because in May of 63, Lincoln is thinking about capturing Jeff Davis. Well, Kilpatrick only went to the outer fortifications and then he retreated down uh, the, the, the peninsula and, uh, and that raid was not successful and you all know that Stoneman lost his job as a result of it. Kilpatrick will command a brigade at Brandy Station. He will lead it over Fleetwood Hill. As a result, he will get his first star as Brigadier General. Later in the month of June 1863, he will, um, uh, he'll, he'll be given command of the 3rd Cavalry Division in the Army of the Potomac. He will lead the 3rd Cavalry Division in the Gettysburg Campaign. He will stop Stuart at Hanover, along with one of his brigade commanders, George Armstrong Custer. Very important to remember that Custer is serving under Kilpatrick in the Gettysburg Campaign. Kilpatrick's other brigade will lead a, a charge that is not so successful on the South Cavalry Field. Elon Farnsworth, the brigade commander, will be killed. Custer will go on to glory on the East Cavalry Field, serving temporarily under General Gregg. And then they will fight throughout the retreat of Lee from Gettysburg at some places like Smithburg, Funkstown, Boonesboro, and all places that Ted Alexander is familiar with. And so Kilpatrick and Custer will be dealing with one another. And I, I get into this in the book uh, pretty extensively from some documents I found at the National Archives where Custer is constantly, seemingly insubordinate to, to Kilpatrick. He's not getting his reports done on time. He's sending um, scouts that he captures from the Confederate forces directly to Pleasanton instead of coming through Kilpatrick's headquarters. Uh, there's all sorts of paperwork at the archives showing that Custer is not really a game player with Kilpatrick here, and Kilpatrick is very frustrated over this. So in the fall of 1863, after some of those battles uh, up and down Route 29, if you're familiar with Central Virginia, um, Kilpatrick will get some bad news. Alice will die in November of 1863. A month later, his son, Judson, of one year old, will also die. And an and artillerist in the Army of the Potomac, a, a diarist that's very famous, Wainwright, will write something to the effect that uh, Kilpatrick is very melancholy and just in the mood to do something crazy. So this is what's happening in the later months of 1863 into 1864. Benjamin Butler, Beast Butler, I'm sure you're all familiar with him. Um, you know that he was part of the expedition against New Orleans. He ran into some problems there with uh, trying to make uh, too much money. It was an embarrassment to the Lincoln administration. And so he is transferred in early 1864 to Fort Monroe, where he will be a department commander, the Department of Virginia and North Carolina. He is a war Democrat. He has aspirations to possibly to be president. He gets into his head after meeting General Wistar, who is already down in the area of Yorktown at the time, that they, they form a, a, a relationship that's very, very close because Wistar is also a Democrat, and he's kind of been shelved down onto the peninsula. And Worcester brings to Butler the idea of a raid, and I cover it in chapter three. I'm not gonna get into the Worcester raid on, on Richmond, but essentially that was 2,000 cavalry, 4,000 infantry 
in the first week of February 1864 to try to go in and capture Richmond and grab Jeff Davis. That is part of the orders, very specifically, capture Davis. This raid is unsuccessful, primarily because a Union soldier who has been sentenced to be executed uh, is able to escape from his incarceration, and he will make his way to Richmond, where he will notify Confederate authorities. And they are waiting at Bottoms Bridge when Wistar and his cavalry get there. And so they decide not to make an attack because it's not going to be a surprise. And Wister and all his troops will retreat back down the peninsula. Kilpatrick knows about this raid and knows that it's unsuccessful. And through his political connections, he is able to get information to Lincoln that I believe says that he has a better plan. And his plan will be to raid Richmond and free the prisoners. Now, there are about 13,000 POWs on Belle Isle. It's an island in the middle of the James River. That's where the enlisted men are. And at Libby Prison, where basically the officers are held. And conditions there are horrible. And Lincoln knows this from exchanged prisoners, particularly officers, that, that once they get exchanged, they either write Lincoln a letter or they come and meet with him personally. And it's the horrendous conditions. And you can read about it in the book. I've got some really very gruesome quotes from official records of, of how the prisoners looked after they were exchanged at this time. Now, there's also some scuttlebutt from Union sympathizers that are in Richmond that the troops, the, the, the POWs, are going to be transferred uh, farther south. So that's got northern authorities concerned. So Kilpatrick is able to get an audience with Lincoln in mid-February, after Butler's raid has failed, get an audience with Lincoln at the White House. Now, Kilpatrick is a division commander. He reports to General Pleasanton, who is the corps commander of the cavalry. Pleasanton reports to General Meade, who is the commander of the Army of the Potomac. Meade reports to General Halleck, general of the armies. And so Kilpatrick has jumped over three command structures here to get a personal interview with Lincoln. That is not going to make Pleasanton and Meade happy. But Kilpatrick, with his ability to sell himself and uh, just his general affability, is able to tell Lincoln that with 4,000 cavalrymen, a six-gun battery, I will capture Richmond. We'll live off the land. We won't take any supply wagons or anything like that. That's what we need to live off the land. In the meantime, another part of that plan has been added. General Custer, I mentioned before, is still part of the 3rd Cavalry Division. He commands the Michigan Brigade. And he has just come back from his honeymoon with Libby. But he also has a problem with Kilpatrick, so he is not going to be on the raid to Richmond. He is going to be sent in a different direction towards Charlottesville with 1,500 cavalrymen, not the Michigan Brigade, other cavalrymen. And his objective is to capture the Virginia Central Railroad Bridge over the Ravana River. I'm not going to get into all of that. It takes too much. I've had a whole lecture on that Charlottesville raid. But essentially, he will be unsuccessful in his objectives, and he will retreat back to Culpeper County. But he is a, supposed to be a diversion to Lee's left while Kilpatrick rides around Lee's right. He does get himself in the paper, though, in the tabloids, uh, he, he, his report said he did a great job, but uh, 
but we know the truth is he never captured. He had the ability to capture Stewart's horse artillery, 16 guns, at Rio Hill outside Charlottesville. He didn't do it. The other part of Kilpatrick's plan, besides Custer and the Fent, is to have Ben Butler come up from the peninsula and attack Richmond from the southeast. Now, this is very important because Kilpatrick is going to plan on that happening if he is going to get inside Richmond. Now, enter this man, 21-year-old Ulrich Dahlgren. And I've heard that uh, Ted is going to maybe talk about Ulrich and see what his opinion is. Uh, my opinion in the book is not very good. Uh, I give him credit for being very brave, very courageous, but um, he should not have been on this raid, and I'm going to try to explain to you why. Ulrich Dahlgren is the son of Admiral Dahlgren. Admiral Dahlgren is very good friends with Abraham Lincoln. And uh, sometimes when I, when I talk to a younger audience, I'll say to, to kids, he was uh, BFF, best friends forever with Lincoln, Admiral Dahlgren. Admiral Dahlgren could walk into the uh, White House without an appointment. That's, that's the level of, of familiarity that they had. He is able to secure a captaincy for his son as a staff officer. He is a staff officer with Franz Siegel, briefly with Ambrose Burnside, and then with Joe Hooker. When Meade takes over the Army of the Potomac at the end of June 1863, Ulrich Dahlgren is begging to go on some kind of an independent command. And he is allowed to, by Meade, he takes a, a number of troop, a number of cavalrymen and goes up around uh, Greencastle, I think it is, and he captures couriers that are on their way to Lee from Jefferson Davis. And those couriers say basically that Lee is not going to get any more reinforcements up north. And Dahlgren leaves his men where they are and rides himself through Confederate lines to get to Meade's headquarters, delivers these uh, letters on the evening of July 2nd. Meade has already decided to stay and fight the Battle of Gettysburg uh, for one more day. And so basically, I don't know how relevant those were, but it gives you an idea of the type of character that Dahlgren is, that he just leaves his men and you know, he sees something very important, so he's got to deliver these letters. After the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, Dahlgren is also commanding some troops and, uh, during the retreat, and he gets sort of, they, they get sort of lost. And he ends up with Kilpatrick, interestingly enough, on July 6th, 1863, near Hagerstown. And he doesn't have a command, so he goes to Kilpatrick and volunteers to be an aide. And Kilpatrick sends him into Hagerstown with uh, part of the 18th Pennsylvania Cavalry, and they make an attack on Confederate uh, cavalry that are in Hagerstown. The men are going up the street dismounted, but Ulrich is on his horse. And Ulrich will ride up the street. There'll be a Confederate uh, flank, flanking movement, so to speak. He will get shot in the right foot. And he will be disabled. He will be brought back to Washington. By August of 1863, doctors say it must be amputated. And so his right leg is amputated just below the knee. He will recuperate during the latter part of the summer and uh, into the fall. And by January of 1864, he's able to mount a horse. He's 21 years old. He wants to get involved in things. Sometime at the end of January, or early February, he hears about the idea of a raid on Richmond. He knew, he heard about Butler's raid. He thinks that Kilpatrick is leading a raid. And so he wants to get on the raid. There's no order that I could find that specifically sends him to Kilpatrick's division. But on February 18th, 1864, he shows up at uh, Rose Hill, Kilpatrick's headquarters, which is on the cover of the book, the house that's there. And he will get himself attached to the raid and he'll get a very important part in that raid. This is a, a map from the, uh, 
from the book. I'm not going to go through every movement here, but you can see it's quite an extensive uh, operation of these cavalrymen. So on February 28, 1864, Kilpatrick will leave Culpeper, Virginia, specifically Stevensburg, with 3,582 men. Now, they're not all from his 3rd Cavalry Division, and that's what's very important, because at this point, he needed good horses and healthy men. And so they had to cobble together that kind of a force from three cavalry divisions. That meant that you had companies and squadrons and parts of regiments taken from this division, brought over to Kilpatrick, and you can see right away there's going to be a command and control problem. You have men serving under officers that they don't know, they are not familiar with. And this is going to be evident as we get down the line with this raid. But anyway, they, they move out of Stevensburg. Dahlgren will be in the lead. He will be leading 460 men as the advance party. His job is to get, across, get down into central Virginia, cross the James River in Goochland County, which is where I live now, where we live, and come into Richmond on the south side and get into Belle Isle and free those prisoners because the bridge to Belle Isle is on the south side of the James. Once those prisoners are, are free, they'll bring them in over the Mayo Bridge into Richmond, they'll burn Richmond, and everything will be great, very successful. 460 men from five different regiments represented. Now, obviously, a cavalry regiment could be 400, 500 men, but that's not how it's operating here because they they don't have the healthy men and the healthy horses to put together, and they have to cobble together his command. Along with uh, Dahlgren is his second in command, Major Edwin Cook from New Jersey, a very good friend of Kilpatrick's. And as they're riding out of Stevensburg, according to uh, one letter I found, Kilpatrick would say to Major Cook, do this thing up right and then ask anything you want. So obviously Kilpatrick is going to depend on Major Cook to keep Dahlgren under control. There's another uh, post-war reminiscence I found where one of Kilpatrick's scouts says, does anyone think that Kilpatrick would go outside his own third division in this mission. And evidently, Kilpatrick was kind of forced to take Dahlgren, but ever the politician, he saw that this was an opportunity for him to ingratiate himself with the powers to be. Kilpatrick will follow with the remainder of the force, about 3,000 men. This is a leap year, and so they leave on the afternoon of the 28th, they ride all night. They capture Ely's Ford. Very interesting way they do that. They got it described. It's very interesting. They get Ely's Ford without really anyone knowing. And they're into Confederate territory because they've crossed the Rapidan. And they ride through Chancellorsville and then to Spotsylvania Courthouse. And this is where, this is the last time that Kilpatrick and Dahlgren will ever see each other. Now, they were going to communicate with, uh, with cell phones. No, they weren't. <laughs> they didn't have cell phones. They didn't have satellites. They didn't have walkie-talkies. They, they each had a signal officer with them from the Signal Corps, and they had a set of rockets, a coded rockets that they were going to send up. Now, rockets are great on a beautiful night like tonight. It'll be a beautiful night. Not going to be that way with uh, Kilpatrick and Dahlgren. So coming out of Spotsylvania, Dahlgren will leave to the right and go down through Louisa, western Hanover County, and into Goochland County. Kilpatrick will raid Beaver Dam Station, which I like to call the corporate headquarters of the Virginia Central Railroad. They destroy five miles of track, 20 buildings there. Uh, they shoot at the president of the railroad who lives uh, not far from the station, Edmund Fontaine, 
and they just totally destroy this place on the afternoon of February 29th. But at that point, it starts to rain, and it will rain all through the night of the 29th to March 1st. Meanwhile, Dahlgren is riding down towards Frederick's Hall. And at Frederick's Hall, uh, the Second Corps Reserve Artillery of the Army of the Northern Virginia is there, 83 guns. He has an opportunity to do something, maybe capture those guns, but he is talked out of it by some Confederate uh, prisoners. They, they, they tell him there's a whole brigade there guarding it. Not true at all. Interesting, though, the fickle finger of fate here. Is that, does that, is that right? Did you pose for this? I didn't. <laughs> An hour and a half before Dahlgren gets near the Virginia Central Railroad uh, near Frederick's Hall, Robert E. Lee has been on a train from Richmond going back to his headquarters in Orange County. And they miss capturing Robert E. Lee by about an hour and a half, maybe two hours. That would have been even better, I think, than capturing Jefferson Davis. No, no, no offense to the gentleman back there who is the descendant. OK, so Dahlgren from, from, from Louisa to Western Hanover, he gets down into Goochland. And in Goochland, this is where he's going to cross the James River. And he has an opportunity to raid some wonderful plantations there along the James River. This is Dover. It's owned by James Morrison. James Morrison is not there. He's down in uh, Louisiana. He has huge holdings in Louisiana and Mississippi, uh, but they raid uh, his property. They destroy a lot of the outbuildings. They do not destroy the house. But the house is no longer there. It burned in the 1930s. And that will be a theme for the next minute or two here. They also stop at Eastwood, which is about less than a mile from Dover. And they will not destroy Eastwood. They will destroy some of the outbuildings. But that will burn in the 1930s. Now, visiting Eastwood, this is what makes this raid so great, is that you have Henry Wise, who is a brigadier general in the Confederate Army. He was also the governor of Virginia. And he is the man who executed John Brown. And, uh, Somewhere along the line, Dahlgren or his men get wind that, uh, that he is at Eastwood. And so they come looking for the man who hanged John Brown. Well, he is notified by a Confederate trooper who happens to be home on R&R, &R, who sees the raiders and notifies him. And I had, I really, it's amazing what comes up when you, re, when you write a book. A descendant of that trooper was at one of my lectures uh, back about six months ago, and she told me about you know, who she was, and, that, and it was just wonderful. Uh, anyway, he is notified, and he and his son-in-law, Plummer Hobson, will ride lickety-split from Eastwood to Richmond to notify Confederate authorities. They will next stop at Sabbath Hill, which is owned by Secretary of War Seddon. Sabbath Hill is 26 rooms, spiral staircase, it has steel shutters on the inside because Seddon is a secretary of war. They will burn some barns there. They will not destroy the house. The house will burn in the 1930s. Now, you're all students of history, so I know you know that there was a depression in the 1930s. You could draw your own conclusions, not for me to make those conclusions for you. Now, Seddon's wife is Sally Seddon. She is reputed to be one of the most beautiful women in Virginia in 1864 and one of the most talented women. She can sing, she can play the piano. And there is a story in post-war writings that she served Colonel Dahlgren blackberry wine. They even cite the vintage as 1844 and that that delayed Dahlgren and he couldn't get across the river. And I. Happy to say I've been able to dissuade this myth 
with what I've been able to come up with in my research. And so I now say there was no blackberry wine story uh, to go along with Sally said and in Goochland County. It has not made me very popular in Goochland County. <laughs> but nevertheless, I have to tell the true story. Now, I told you she is so beautiful and so talented that I had a name, uh, we had a name, Art Beagle, Sally Seddon. <laughs> and she is currently staying at Dr. Summers' house right now. So I hope she's behaving herself. The other thing that's unique about this raid is that there was a black guide attached to Dahlgren. And there has been various iterations over the years of who this man is. And I think I've been able to pretty much nail down the identity of Martin Roberson from a pension record of a white officer who escaped from Libby Prison. And Martin was able to assist him. And I have a whole chapter on this in the book. And he was able to assist this officer when when there was the escape in February of 64 from Libby, most of the officers went to the peninsula. This fellow went west. He was taken care of by Martin and his family. Martin escorted him through Confederate lines all the way to Meade's headquarters. He gets to Meade's headquarters probably about the 27th of February. And uh, an officer at Meade's headquarters writes Dahlgren a note. He says, question this man five minutes and you'll know he's the one for you. So he agrees to go on the raid with Dahlgren. He tells Dahlgren he knows Goochland County. He can get him across the river. Well, they get to Sabbath Hill, Sabbath Hill, and the river's you know, a quarter mile from, from Sabbath Hill. And they get down to where the ford is. And I told you it was raining on the 29th, right? Raining very hard in torrents. And the river is in freshet. It is flooded. They can't get over the river. Dahlgren can't get to the south bank to come in to raid Belle Isle. And so Martin says, I know a spot three miles down will get you across. And so Dahlgren agrees to it. They ride down to Mannequin Ferry. Dahlgren puts a man in the water. Now, do you think the river is going to be any lower three miles down than it was at Sabbath Hill. No. And so, Dahlgren is getting very upset with Martin. And Martin has agreed to do this with the idea that he'll be rewarded. And if not, dire things will happen to him. They, go, they march down a little further, down near Tuckahoe Plantation. And Dahlgren runs into some other contrabands that have escaped from plantations because the Yankees are all over the place. You know, they're, they're about three or four hundred blacks following in Dahlgren's wake on this raid. And he, run in, he runs into some and they say, he said, you know, we're, we're headed towards Richmond. And they say, no, you're going in the wrong direction. Immediately Dahlgren will have poor Martin strung up. And it's, I think it's the only example of a white Union officer hanging a black civilian during the Civil War, but um, I would Stand, I would love to know if there's another one, but I can't find another one. At least I haven't found one. So that's the mystery of him. Now, Dahlgren will decide to attack Richmond anyway from the north side of the river, and he will come in on the Three Chop Road. And if any of you are familiar with the University of Richmond, the campus is very close to Three Chop Road, right here. Okay? And uh, this house, uh, Green, the Ben Green Farm, is still there. It's been restored by a, a man named Castle Adams, and it's a beautiful, beautiful brick. Uh, I think it's a Federalist design house. And so, because Wise has turned the alarm out, local defense troops have marched from Richmond down what they call the Western Plank Road, today Cary Street Road, and they will initially confront Dahlgren here near the Ben Green farm where there's a curve in the road. This is the detail here. This is another map from the book. And he, Dahlgren will rout the armory battalion. In his uh, success, he will continue down the Three Chop Road to the Western Plank Road and confront two battalions of local defense troops under Captain John McInerney, 
who has served in the Army of Northern Virginia but has been disabled by a wound and is serving, I think, in the post office department. And so McInerney has about 800 men. He aligns them across the road. Dahlgren will attack. McInerney says to his men, now some of them are young boys, some of them are older, but a lot of them are military age. They are serving in these ranks because they have a specific uh, skill working at Tredegar or something like that. And so he says to them, give me two volleys, that's all I need. And that's exactly what the men do. Dahlgren charges down. This is like maybe 5 o'clock in the afternoon on March the 1st. And his men will rise up. They'll fire two volleys. They'll empty maybe 50 saddles. And Dahlgren will retreat back up the Three Chop Road and make a large crescent around Richmond. Meanwhile, Judson Kilpatrick has come from Beaver Dam Station. He has come down uh, what we would call Route 1, and um, he has attacked Richmond from the north. The intermediate, oh, excuse me. The intermediate lines here are at Laburnum Avenue, if any of you are familiar with Richmond. Uh, he will never be able to develop any kind of an attack uh, because of the rain the cavalry can't fight across the farm fields. There's a lot of uh, mud in, in the furrows and like that. They will fight dismounted. They will only get to about 250 yards from the uh, fortifications here. The heavy, uh, the heavy artillery battalions will be fighting as infantry. There'll be some light artillery used. Kilpatrick will follow his, fire his guns. And he does not hear from Dahlgren. He has no idea where Dahlgren is. This is by the afternoon of March the 1st, 1864. He has no idea where Butler is. He decides to call off the attack. And he will retreat uh, over a military road and out crossing the meadow bridges and basically camp for the night near Mechanicsville, between Mechanicsville and Atlee Station. Henry Davies, I mentioned him early in this talk, he is serving now as a brigadier under Kilpatrick and his second in command, and he will uh, provide the, the rear guard for, for this retreat out of Richmond. When they're camped near Atlee Station, the real hero of our story here, Wade Hampton, will come from near Fredericksburg. Now, because of all the campaigning in the summer and the fall of 1863, Confederate cavalry is really down to basically nothing. He will have only 300 men to ride from Fredericksburg to the outskirts of Richmond. But he'll have two regiments, the 1st and 2nd North Carolina, and two guns from Hart's Battery. He will make a night attack on Kilpatrick's lines. He will rout the 7th. Michigan Cavalry, and will force Kilpatrick to move. Now, a lot of uh, commentators have said, you know, Kilpatrick was routed. He wasn't routed. The 7th Cavalry, 7th Michigan Cavalry was routed. Hampton is, is a wonderful, wonderful commander on this night. As he says in his report, I ordered the most difficult attack. You could order a night attack. Meanwhile, Dahlgren now has made this arc around Richmond during the night of March the 1st into the early morning hours of March the 2nd. His command will become divided. He and Major Cook will have about 90 to 95 men. They'll go down one road. The rest of his command, maybe 350 men, will go down a different road under Captain John Mitchell. Captain Mitchell will eventually get back to Kilpatrick's command near Tunstall Station. Dahlgren never will. Dahlgren will cross the Pamunkey River at Hanover Town Ferry on a couple of boats that they've been able to scrounge up. And then he will ride across King William County, being followed by Confederate snipers and guerrillas. 
He will cross the Mattapani River on March the 2nd into King and Queen County. And there's a great recollection from one of his, uh, one of his troopers where he's the last man to get on the ferry, the, you know, the flatboat to, to go across the Mattapani. He's leaning on his crutch and he's firing his pistol at these uh, snipers and guerrillas that have been following him. So no question that he is a brave guy. He will get into King and Queen County and he'll follow this road here down looking to get to Gloucester Point because at Gloucester Point there will be a gunboat that will protect him. Commanding the Confederates that are tracking him is Lieutenant James Pollard of the 9th Virginia Cavalry. His company is home on R&R, &R, you know, sort of getting the horses back in shape. He's joined by some men from the 5th Virginia Cavalry and the King and Queen Home Guard. And they put together a force of about 150 men and they end up, because Dahlgren stops here at Garnett's Creek, they will put together a, uh, a, an ambush site here where the road from Stevensburg uh, meets the River Road. Dahlgren will rest his men on the evening of the 2nd. Major Cook will count the cartridges. How much do we have left in terms of ammunition? There are only 70 cartridges left among all the men. They will mount up from Garnett's Creek. They'll start going down the River Road. A scout will come back and say there's a barricade in the road, Colonel. He will bring his officers forward, Major Cook, Cap uh, Lieutenant Merritt, uh, Lieutenant Bartley, the signal officer, and the scouts will be in the front. Dahlgren will move down this road and see what's up, and then pandemonium will break out. He'll confront a man at the barricade. The man will tell him to surrender. Dahlgren will say no. He'll pull his pistol, it will misfire. At that point, everything breaks loose. And this Harper's Weekly kind of shows you, it's, it's in the evening, so it's even hard to see it. Uh, but, but these men are firing carbines, muskets, squirrel guns, pistols, whatever they got from the King and Queen Home Guard in addition to the, the cavalry carbines. Dahlgren will go down with five bullets in his body. Major Cook will be pinned under his horse, but get out of it. Uh, Lieutenant Merritt will be wounded in the leg, but. The, other off, the officers will get back to the men. Cook is now in command. He says, it's now every man for himself. The only way we're going to get out of this thing is if we try to escape on our hands and knees. The Confederates are out in the darkness there. Most of the men say, we've had it. We're not going any farther. And so most of the men who are left, you know, maybe 70, they will surrender the next day to the Confederate forces. The officers and the scouts will crawl up on their hands and knees with Cook. They'll get to an overseer's house uh, by breakfast the next day, and they'll want to, they're, they're eating breakfast. The overseer's wife will send a slave to uh, the owner, and the owner happens to be the Reverend Bagby, who is also a captain in the Home Guard, and he will get the drop on these officers, burst into the cabin, and they will be sent to Libby Prison. A few troopers will make their way uh, to the York River and be secured on a gunboat. Dahlgren's laying dead in the road. The next morning, a young boy named William Littlepage, uh, who is about 13 years old, he will start rifling through Dahlgren's body, trying to find you know, special effects. And he gets a cigar case, I think a watch. He'll find orders in Dahlgren's body, a memorandum book and some loose papers. Now, I, I kind of joke, because if, if I'm in Virginia and I mention King and Queen County, it hasn't changed since the Civil War. Believe me, all those roads are exactly the same. And so it's not unusual for somebody 13 years old not to be able to read, but that's a side <laughs> joke. Uh, Anyway, he brings him to his, his, um, his captain, Captain Holbrook. The captain can read. He immediately sees 
that these are important officers, uh, orders. He brings them to Lieutenant Pollard. Pollard brings them to his colonel, Colonel Beale of the 9th Virginia Cavalry. Beale will send them to Richmond to Fitzhugh Lee, General Lee's nephew, who happens to be in Richmond at the time. And Lee will bring them to Jefferson Davis. And there are two sets of orders. And one set says, capture Jefferson Davis and his cabinet and burn the hateful city of Richmond. The other set of orders say, Jeff Davis and his cabinet must be killed on the spot. That's tough stuff, OK? And Davis kind of laughs it off in a way. He says to Judah Benjamin, why, they, they, they mean you, Mr. Benjamin. <laughs> and, uh, and eventually, these orders get printed in the paper. They will, um, Braxton Bragg, who was in Richmond at the time, and Seddon, Secretary of War, will want to hang the raiders who have been captured immediately for that kind of black flag warfare. And so they take, they make uh, Xerox copies of the orders. I, that always gets a joke. I, that, that, that always gets a laugh. And they actually make photographs of these orders, 50 copies. And a set is sent to uh, Robert E. Lee. And they say to Lee, find out what's going on from Meade. And Lee is very concerned about this because his son Rooney has been a prisoner of war and may be ready to be exchanged if the Confederacy starts hanging uh, Union troopers, it's going to be a problem for Rooney Lee. So he writes a letter to General Meade, and Meade sends it to Kilpatrick, who in the meantime has retreated from Richmond, has gotten down to uh, New Kent Courthouse, where he has been rescued by Ben Butler, who has come up way too late. And they march down to Yorktown, and they come back on transports. They're back in Culpeper. And Kilpatrick looks at these letters, or these orders, and said, I didn't authorize these. I, I signed them in red, approved. Well, I don't think red is going to show up on photographic copies in 1864. But don't forget, Henry Davies is his second in command. And I mentioned he's a New York City lawyer, right? He has probably crafted some response for Kilpatrick. Kilpatrick said, I am not responsible for anything that says we're going to kill Jefferson Davis. Meade sends this back to Lee. Lee is satisfied. Lee wants to stop all of this. We're now at the end of March 1864, getting ready to start the spring campaign. Now, the Confederacy has sent these other copies to all the European capitals, uh, including the Vatican. They're looking for some kind of... Uh, sympathy here. But as things progress into the spring, the fighting is going to start. As you know, Grant is going to be there, and we're going to start the Overland Campaign. And so it all kind of goes away. Dahlgren, we left him in King and Queen County. He is shipped to Richmond. He's buried secretly in Oakwood Cemetery by Jefferson Davis on his orders. His father tries to get him back. He offers $100 in gold. And they go to find him. And his body has disappeared. It's not in Oakwood Cemetery. Elizabeth Van Lu, the great Union spy in Richmond, and her cronies have dug up the body and brought it out to Hanover County, where it is buried, no, Henrico County, excuse me where it is buried, and it will remain there until after the war is over. And she sends a message through Ben Butler to the Admiral, don't worry, the body is secure. He will eventually get the body back after the war is over, and there will be a formal military funeral in Philadelphia in the fall of 1865, and he'll be laid to rest at Laurel Hill Cemetery. Now, almost finished, but I have to tell you how much clout Admiral Dahlgren had. Because, and I, got, I have it all laid out in the book, after the war was over, he had the United States Detective Agency, which was part of the Provost Marshal General's office, go and track down everything that was on Dahlgren's body to find out what happened to it. A Confederate cut off his 
gold pinky ring. They found out what happened to it. He had a crutch with him. They found out what happened to it. He had a prosthesis with him. They found out what happened to it. It was being used by one of Mosby's command, Captain John Ballard. When they went, when the detectives went to Ballard's house, they uh, said, I heard you got Dahlgren's leg. He immediately took it off and handed it to him. He wanted no problems. They found out what happened to his overcoat. What happened to the horse? That is, that's political clout for you to be able to do that. So that gives you an idea of how much Admiral Dahlgren had, had to do with uh, running of the government, so to speak. And so um, that's all documented in the book, which, I, which is new on Dahlgren. It's never been out there before. I got it at the National Archives. And so it's just an extremely unique cavalry raid. It had so many different things involved with it. The assassination of a head of state, the hanging of a black guide, um, political power, you know, what happens and like that. And so uh, I'm just so happy to be able to get this story out there. And at that, I'm going to stop and turn it over to the panel because I know we'll get some more information for you through the panelists' questions. Thank you very much. I'm good. I'm good. Is that how it works? So I, I'll stand here like this. Can I relax a little bit now? No, better not. Oh, I guess I better not. Well, th thank you very much, Bruce, for that that fascinating presentation. And and just by way of of preface to build on the uh, the introduction that that Mark gave. Uh, I was on the staff here at the Army Military History Institute, Army Heritage and Education Center for over 43 years. And there were so many rewarding aspects of such work, but what was especially appealing was all the wonderful people that you meet. And many of them have made military history, from privates to four and five star generals, and others are descendants of soldiers from earlier periods, and still others are, are people who study and write about military history. And We have in the audience some of them here, uh, Mike Cavanaugh and Ed Root, certainly my fellow panelists, Ted Alexander, but uh, what a, a remarkable uh, example of this you are, Bruce. And, and in the course of, of meeting these people, the acquaintanceship will often develop into professional friendships and sometime will even ripen into personal friendships. And uh, you and I have been friends since the 1990s, as you say, and it's uh, a wonderful privilege for me to be able to share in this occasion and to publicly uh, affirm the, the friendship and the great regard that I have for you personally as well as professionally uh, with the important work that you are doing on and have done on the uh, Kilpatrick and Dahlgren raid. Uh, in, in the book, uh, you convey it with an engaging style that, that sweeps the reader along just with a cavalryman on the raid with the defenders trying to put together some means of, of blocking the attack. And thank goodness this, this other critic uh, that, that you mentioned uh, was not allowed to, to govern the case. You know, there are people out there, probably in any profession, but here in the Army Military History Institute, we'll talk about the history profession, who think that they have to be boring in order to prove that they're scholarly. But all that they really prove is that they're boring. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, history is fascinating. And it is the responsibility of the, the writer, it is the responsibility of the speaker to capture and convey the excitement of history. And what can be more exciting that a cavalry raid, uh, which threatens to penetrate into the, uh, the enemy capital and perhaps capture or even kill the, the enemy president. And you uh, 
convey this excitement so well in your book, just as all of us can appreciate the enthusiasm with which uh, you delivered your talk to us here this afternoon. Now let me, let me ask, what led you to select this particular subject uh, as the topic of your first book? Would you? Sure. That That's a very context? good question because when I first embarked on a project that I wanted to get published, I wanted to write about the cavalry. I just was interested in that. And I looked around, and at the time, now this is like in the early 90s, no one had done anything on Judson Kilpatrick. We all know he's called Kill Cavalry and hard on his men and his horses. And I thought, well, why don't I write something, a biography of Kilpatrick? And I started to accumulate uh, information on that. And, um, and I still have all that information. Uh, and, but in the meantime, my good friend Horace Mewburn, who is an expert on John Mosby, and I know Ted Alexander knows him, I know, Horace, uh, I, I know that Dick knows him. Uh, Horace uh, had written some articles for Blue and Gray magazine, and he knew Dave Roth very well, and he set up a meeting with Dave and I in Virginia, and, um, and so we, Dave said, well, why don't you write something on the Kilpatrick Dahlgren rate? Because if, if you know Blue and Gray, you know that there's the feature article and then there's the general's tour. And a raid lends itself to a general's tour because you got all the roads you have to follow and it's great. And so that's what I embarked on. And, and in 2003, the article came out. But I had so much stuff left over that couldn't fit in one magazine article that I said to myself, well, I'm going to set Kilpatrick aside and I'm going to pursue this because it's a really interesting topic. And at the time, there had only been two books written about it. And the first one was done, I think, around 1959, eight hours before Richmond by Pat Jones, Virgil Carrington Jones, who did a very credible job on the raid at the time and, and used for the sources that he dug up. And then there was another book called The Dahlgren Raid that I didn't care for too much. And so I thought it might lend itself to a book-length study. And that's how I got involved in it. And I have, you know, I'd like to say it took me 10 years. My wife will say that it's a lot longer than that. But uh, I, I really did try to scour all over the country. And if you look at the bibliography, uh, it, it, it's, it's, all, it's not stuff that I just copied from some other book. I actually went all, all for those places. And so I was able to find out a lot of things about the raid. And some of them were in soldier letters that were printed in newspapers. Very common thing back then for a soldier to write home and have his mother or his girlfriend or his wife print it in the paper. But at the time I was doing this, you'd crank the microfilm until you found it. Now I think you can do go online and you can do a digital search and all like that. Well, that's how I got a lot of the information. And so I, I accumulated a lot and a lot of files, and the result was the book. Thank you very much. And as you said, you certainly did extensive research here in the vast archives of the Army Military History Institute. And uh, I know I speak for all of my colleagues in saying that we're pleased that you could make such good use of, of our uh, manuscript and printed and photographic holdings here in, in our facility. And you travel to many other archives as well to, to do yes. research and contact them. Would you share with the audience some of the other institutions where you did research as well as MHI? Well, I, it's hard to believe, but I actually changed jobs uh, in 1997 to be closer to Washington, D.C. And I, I, I took an equivalent job as an assistant superintendent in Alexandria. So I could be at the Library of Congress in uh, 20 minutes from where I worked, and so I could go over after work at night, I could go on Saturdays, it made it a lot easier uh, to do the research. But I also went to Michigan, Indiana. Michigan, there's not only the State Library, but all of the major universities there, uh, particularly at the University of Michigan, has wonderful sources on the Michigan Brigade. And Kilpatrick took Michigan men with him. Custer didn't take his Michigan Brigade when he went to Charlottesville. He was given some of the uh, 
uh, United States regular uh, cavalry, and um, I think it was a, a New Jersey regiment and uh, another one that eludes me at the Ohio regiment. But, but there's an amazing amount of information in Ohio. I, I just, yeah, I just went all over it. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, I think another real strength of your book is that you set the broader context for the raid. You go back and look at Stoneman's first raid in May of 1863. Uh, you deal with the uh, aborted uh, activities of General Wistar and the corresponding operations of the Army of the Potomac under General Sedgwick on the, the Rapidan line, trying to make demonstrations in favor of, uh, of Wistar. I think that this context helps the reader even the better to understand uh, what the circumstances were like when uh, Kilpatrick himself cut loose at, at the end of February. Um, wh why did you choose to have that, that broader range of uh, of coverage in, in your book and still succeed in keeping the focus on the Kilpatrick raid? Well, I thought it would be a good idea to give people that kind of a background because as I was doing the research, it showed up that Avril, uh, General Avril, uh, in December of 62, he, spot, he wrote down a plan to raid Richmond. It was never approved. Even Ulrich Dahlgren, when he was a staff officer under Hooker, came up with a plan to raid Richmond. It was never approved. So I thought it would be a good idea to look at other aspects of planning for a raid on Richmond before we got to the main event. You point out that one of the uh, commonly held but mistaken beliefs was that the defenders of, of Richmond were either very young or very old or, or quite uh, infirm. Uh, would you specify even more than you did in your talk sure. uh, what was the nature of the force available uh, to General Elsey in the Department of Richmond? The, um, I mentioned the heavy artillery battalions. This was a, what would be a good word to use? A cushy job if you were in Richmond. If you were well connected, you wanted to serve in the heavy artillery uh, battalions because Richmond really wasn't attacked after McClellan left. And so these were what we call good jobs to have. And I went back to the, uh, the rosters of all of those four regiments and looked at the ages of the men. And I came up with different means and median, averages and uh, means and median ages. And they were all in their mid-20s. So they were not young kids and they were not old men that were facing Kilpatrick in the trenches there. I also found that Epa Hutton's brigade, which had served in Lee's army, and it was at, in an R&R &R down at Chafin's, Chafin's farm, I believe it was. Uh, I found a, a document that said a man in the 19th Virginia Infantry was killed during Dahlgren's raid, which meant that part of Epa Hutton's division, uh, the brigade, was moved up to those lines in front of Richmond. And so, I thought that that is a story that also had to be told because, it, like, like I said when I was talking about Dahlgren and the attack on Three Chop Road, they had men in those local defense uh, troops who were like, they had a very uh, specific duty like uh, in rifling barrels and things like that. They were not kids, they were not old men. They happened to be good at what they did, so they were assigned to Richmond. Uh, they might be involved with chemicals, making, uh, powder and things like that so that and you pointed out that those local defense troops workers in war industry that one who was killed was a very critical uh was killed out near green's farm and on the i did they didn't know how they were going to replace him right and would you specify what his particular responsibility i knew he was going to stump me i i knew he would stump me <laughs> well i learned about it from you i know <laughs> uh I believe that he was one of the ones that, what, that rifled the barrel somehow. Do you remember? And I, I think it was un, untwisted, the, the barrels, 
succeeded in the... Oh, oh yeah, uh, the, the, the rifle barrels that were damaged. Yeah, he, straightener, he was a barrel straightener. You got yeah. that straight. You got it straight. <laughs> now I got it straight. That's, uh, that question has never come up before, and I've lectured a number of times on this book. But, but it, re it really struck me that even though the casualties were very light from the Confederate point of view, oh, yeah. there at Green's Farm, yeah. nevertheless, there was one person whose death handicapped the work in the war industry for months thereafter. You I, I think, it, yeah, the letter said it would be months before they could find a technician. Right. And, and what you identified in the average age of the uh, soldiers in the four heavy artillery battalions uh, was tremendously impressive and a, a very useful uh, addition to our, our knowledge that, that you went to all that depth to gather the information uh, so we can have the better understanding of the combat capabilities uh, of those troops. Something else that your book reflects so well is the, the place of, of chance or serendipity in history. We, we see it so often in, in so many uh, ways. Uh, you, you alluded to uh, uh, to Kilpatrick's fight with Jeb Stewart at Hanover on June 30th of 1863. Well, if you stop and think, if the 18th Pennsylvania Cavalry had moved a little faster or the 2nd North Carolina Cavalry had moved a little more slowly, Kilpatrick would have cleared out of Hanover before Stewart arrived, and uh, Stewart presumably would have continued straight north and might well have joined forces with Jubal Early. We can't know but it's just one of those little co coincidences, seemingly minor at the time, that have such a long-range uh, impact. But uh, an if instance- If I could just take up on that. You know, Kilpatrick doesn't get credit for the stopping him at Hanover. And I certainly didn't set out to be an apologist for Kilpatrick. I know he has his, his, uh, his problems. But I, I read so many letters and diaries of the men that served under him, that I tried to bring that out in the first chapter, that he was not totally a buffoon or anything like that. He did have some redeeming qualities of leadership. In fact, there's a, a letter from a man in the 2nd New York Cavalry that said um, that he has done some rash things all must acknowledge, but that he has also given a name to the Union Cavalry. And when history shall write her scrolls, Beside her Marat, she will be happy to write the name of Buford and Kilpatrick. You don't usually see those two names in, a, in, a, in any kind of uh, history of the cavalry. And, and Bruce, uh, several years ago, you gave a splendid presentation to the Harrisburg Civil War Roundtable on General Kilpatrick's relations with his own troopers and their judgments of him. Uh, which is much different from the, the commonplace that uh, they hated him because he uh, got them all killed. And we have many members here, John, George, Al, Dave, perhaps some of you uh, heard that talk as, uh, as well uh, in that presentation. And we're looking forward to your return to our roundtable in, in November. But building on uh, your presentation here this afternoon, uh, Another instance of, of serendipity, right with your talk, and I was just setting the context of, of the Battle of, of Hanover uh, as an instance of it earlier. But General Wise, you know, his brigade is serving in South Carolina at this period of the war. But just by chance, he happens to be on leave and he is back at his, his daughter and son-in-law's plantation there in Goochland and is able to escape and get to Richmond, if he had not been there, would the alarmists coming into town have had as much credibility uh, as uh, someone who was a former governor of Virginia and a, a general in the Confederate Army has? Uh, just Right, because he sets the alarm, and that brings out the local defense troops, and they march from Richmond down the Western Plank Road. Uh, if that hadn't happened, you know, Dahlgren might have gotten in a lot closer to Richmond, and that area of Richmond was not as well defended. 
Dahlgren got in and had some fighting, coming back to Kilpatrick, north of town, on, on the Brook Turnpike. You talked about the effect of the rain, the muddy fields. Do you see other factors that prevented him from pressing the attack on that, uh, that afternoon, uh, which is really the key, the key point of the main, the main part of the cavalry raid? I think the, the problem was intelligence. And my good friend Horace always likes to say, uh, the shelf life of intelligence is very short. And the Union forces had been getting intelligence from Liz Van Lu and from other sources. And for some reason, they interpreted those uh, reports as sort of giving a false sense of the amount of firepower or the, the amount of defense that the Confederates could put out there. And so I think that is a, a major concept that Kilpatrick didn't grasp, that once he got to Richmond, he really expected just to ride right into Richmond and knock a few pickets out of the way. The outer defenses were not manned at all, so they rode right through the, uh, the uh, outer defenses, and, and, but when they got to the intermediate defenses, with the alarm and with the forces that they could put together, they had several thousand men waiting for them, and not to disparage the cavalry, but the cavalry was not in the mood to attack on horseback a fortification with artillery and musket fire. I just don't see them ever doing it. That's more what the infantryman does. In the summary analysis of your book, you have many insights. There's one phrase you use that resonates with me. You referred to General Kilpatrick's, quoting you now, tangential grasp of reality. <laughs> Would you elaborate a little on what you... What, you what really you read that pretty... Give me the typos that you found, too. I could use that for the next edition. Kilpatrick was a... I guess you would say that. You know, he's 26 years old. I guess the term would be he's on the make. He wants, to, he wants promotion. He wants to be a major general. He wants corps command. I mean, there are guys, there are letters written by men in the ranks that think that Kilpatrick is going to be the commander of the Cavalry Corps soon. They really believe that. I think he believed that. He is, he's just that kind of a guy. He, he, he wants to be a celebrity. And this is a perfect uh, segue for this. Does anybody know a descendant of General Kilpatrick who is a celebrity today? If you know, OK. Does any, do you know? All right. You know, OK. Who is it? Yeah, Anderson Cooper is a direct descendant of Judson Kilpatrick. And when I write a description of him physically, I talk about Kilpatrick's china blue eyes. And if you look at Anderson Cooper, I don't know how often you look at CNN, but uh, you'll see those china blue eyes. And if he turns his head a certain way on a profile, he's got that Kilpatrick nose and jaw without the whiskers. Check it out next time. Well, Bruce, I have uh, some other comments, uh, questions to ask you, but I'll hold off on them because I'm looking forward to uh, hearing the, the questions that uh, my fellow panelist, Ted Alexander, will pose to you. So just again, to summarize, I've uh, welcomed this opportunity to uh, converse with you about the very important book that you've written and the engaging presentation that you've given to us this afternoon. Thank you very much, Dick. I appreciate it. He's a great guy. Well, it is. It's, uh, it's a great book. And as I, it reads kind of like a, a novel. It's kind of like a, a movie. Uh, so that I'd love to get a hold of Spielberg if anybody has his, uh, has his phone number. That original reviewer maybe wasn't too far off in some sense. It, you, you're that rare quality of uh, a very good historian with meticulous research, and you can write. 
It's like Dick said, some of the historians want to continue to be born. But uh, this is a very engaging narrative. Uh, I've been interested in Ulrich Dalgren all my life. Um, I grew up in Greencastle, Pennsylvania, just 40 miles down the road from here. And uh, I brought my cousin along today, and as we were talking in the car coming up, many people referred to him as Dow Green. That's how they pronounced it, uh, Dow Green. We have a street named in honor of Dalgren, and uh, we have a tablet in the town square about his exploits in Greencastle on 2 and 4 July 1863. If you come to Greencastle and you're in the town square, you're on the battlefield. Uh, the same way if you go to Hagerstown, where on 6 July uh, 1863, during the retreat from Gettysburg, he received the critical wound that cost him his leg. Um, if you're going down North Potomac Street and you're just uh, a block from the town square, you're about in the area where he, you're on the battlefield again. It's, a, it's an urban battlefield, probably one of the largest of, with cavalry in, in, during the Civil War. And that's where he received the uh, wound. That, uh, and he, he keeps riding around that day with that bullet in his foot. And I think it's one of these scenarios where he finally gets, the, it's kind of like Albert Sidney Johnson at Shiloh, but he survives. He starts getting faint. It looks like he's going to fall off his horse. And they said, what's the matter? Oh, I was shot in the foot a little while back. And as we know, uh, it uh, cost him his leg. Uh, there is a story out there. I don't know if it's apocryphal that may perhaps, because of his standing, because of his dad, uh, the, they wanted to pay all due respect, and the leg was buried, and that they had a for have you Did you come across that? I know the story you're going to tell. Tell the story, and then we can... Probably apocryphal, uh, but it, it, it's, the story goes they took the leg, made a casket for it, had an honor guard at the Na Washington Navy Yard, and actually... Uh, placed it in the foundation of a building down there. So what, what do you say about that? And they that? put a plaque, I think, There's on there. On it. But when they destroyed the building, they never found the leg. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> apocryphal sounds like a good term. So uh, I, uh, from reading the book, you make it very clear that Dahlgren uh, shouldn't have been on this raid at all. Uh, he was still had not recovered from the amputation. It seems like every other uh, event or incident there, he, he's wincing and they're uh, lifting him into the saddle or lifting him off the saddle. Um, the, uh, I, I was uh, taken, and you, you bring this out, I was taken by the lack of security for this raid. Uh, you know, uh, we <laughs> turn to the movies, it's kind of a bad movie, but it's a play off on uh, Grierson's raid, John Wayne's Horse Soldiers. Mm. There's a line in there where they uh, have to told the men we're, they're going on leave for a parade up in Nashville. Everybody's all excited when in reality they're going on this secret mission. Uh, well, obviously, they weren't telling Kilpatrick's men that they were going on a, to a parade in Washington or anything. Everybody seems to be um, spilling the beans. It looks like we're going on a raid to Richmond. And as I'm reading this, I'm just saying to myself, shut up. You know, don't, don't <laughs> shut up. Don't say that. But everybody's talking about uh, th this raid. I was taken by the uh, brutality that you point out. Uh, there was a lot of brutality, as you know, in the Civil War on the Missouri border. Uh, Quantrell's Raiders and all that, we've read about them. 
But it seems like every place where Kilpatrick's men and Dahlgren stop, they st the first goal is to start looting uh, civilian property at these various plantations. And I was really taken aback uh, on page 152, you suggest they were also looking for women. And I don't know, you didn't follow through on this, mm. on that, so I don't know what was going on there. Any thoughts? Uh, well, that, I, I gave you as much as I had. I, I didn't have, <laughs> maybe I didn't want to fill in the blanks on my own, but uh, maybe you have a but now there. I'd have to go back and check the source. It might have been a southern source, you know, too, uh, because there is a, there what I had, I did mention one story when they were in Goochland where they, and this is this is a southern source that they herded some horses into a barn and mules and they set the barn on fire. And that's, that's a story that you hear out in Goochland, just like the blackberry wine. And it doesn't make any sense, because why would guys who are eating up horses, like every 40 miles, burn up horses, keep the horses? They had lead horses with them. They were stealing horses on every plantation they stopped at. In Goochland, they decided to put them all in a bar. That didn't make any sense. So, uh, so I tried to bring out everything there was to, to talk about. And, and let it fall and see how you... So I, I was taken by the brutality and, and the, uh, threats against civilian lives. And, uh, you know, not just taking food and no, all, taking pieces of furniture, cutting up rugs. Yeah, I think, didn't they take a watch from a cripple man or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, all that going on. Yeah. It seemed like that was... That can be a distraction if you, if you let, uh, let your force degenerate into undisciplined behavior like that, you're going to have problems. That's a perfect segue into the command and control issue that I brought up in the beginning. They had a lot of men serving under officers that they didn't know, and men commanding soldiers that they didn't know. And that was one of the, the big problems of putting together this kind of a force from three different divisions. And it's a you know, command and control is a big issue. It, it is, and people don't realize <laughs> that. They're, those are, are little nuances that are very important. And they had put together a, a task force, what we call it then. It's a task force for this mission. Yeah. Jeb Stewart had done the same thing for his Chambersburg raid of October 1862. He, it sounds like they're picking the best men and the best horses. Jeb Stewart just, I think, was picking the best horses. For, for the Chambersburg raid, for example. But it sounds like they're trying to get the best troopers also. Is that correct? Yeah. Those that are healthy. Yeah. That are healthy. Yeah, healthy. Uh, you know, I started looking at this, and you can't help but compare this event to uh, modern incidents where they tried to free prisoners or went on a select raid. And this had the complexity of at least the Cabanatuan raid in the Philippines in World War II, and it certainly had the competency of Benghazi or the Iranian hostage uh, attempt uh, where things fell apart. Absolutely. I, after the book was done, and I wish I had thought about this when I was doing the book, but uh, we have a fellow who comes on our tours. He's a captain in the Navy. He teaches at uh, the Naval War College, and he's a Navy SEAL. And I happened to be talking to him about the raid and everything. And, and I said, what about that when, when we had the Iranian hostage situation? And that failed. And he sent me the report. And I, I didn't read the whole thing yet. But uh, in looking at the summary, command and control, uh, the, the terrain, uh, weather conditions, a lot of those things show up in the, in the executive summary. That same thing happened to Kilpatrick and Dahlgren. Yeah, because on that Iranian hostage thing, they were trying to do inner service uh, cooperation. Exactly, yep. Having yep. unit integrity of yep. one service trying to do the job. Um, I, uh, something I've wanted to ask in this, um, and I wanted to get your opinion, in the, in the book Blood on the Moon by Ed Steers, mm. who's one of the leading Lincoln assassination scholars, some of you probably know Ed, uh, he goes, in, in the early part of the book, goes directly to this raid 
And he go, he he buys the uh, the Lincoln. I mean, I mean the Jeff Davis assassination theory, and he sees that to build his case for the assassination of, of Lincoln. W what are your thoughts on that? I've had that question before, and I really didn't deal with that uh, because that wasn't my focus. And I think it's a stretch, you know, because I, 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 I don't I don't believe that the Confederate government was involved with the Lincoln assassination. I think it was more the Booth, sort of like a freewheeling agent on it. But that's just my own opinion. I, and I, I certainly am not an expert at all on the Lincoln assassination. I would never claim to be. The, the, uh, the book is, is a good look at the American cavalry tradition. And that's a term that's flown out a lot. The, the American cavalry tradition. But think about it. In reality, we don't have much of a cavalry tradition in the true sense of the word. In the early days of the Republic, there were a few regiments raised, and then they were disbanded because they were considered too expensive. Right. And then in the pre-Civil War day and the post-Civil War days, cavalry was nothing more than a constabulary, by and large, out west. So it's only in the Civil War that we get to have this tradition of the mounted charges and all that. Do you agree? Oh, yeah. I would agree with that. And the Mexican War. The, the charges the Mexican of the dragoons that uh, I know you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if I could just say one thing. Mark alluded in his introduction that uh, we had a, a reenactment of Dahlgren's raid in Goochland in 2012. And I rode with these guys, 85 guys for three days. Uh, I drew a line at sleeping on the ground. I didn't do that. <laughs> the fellow organizing it, who played Dahlgren, uh, he got permission from all the landowners, and they were going to ride along the same roads as Dahlgren, but on, on grassy property rests because they didn't want to hurt the horse's hooves and things like that. And we got lost. Um, we got, I remember going down, we were crossing a creek, and I, there was two horses in front of me, and it was a lot of mud by the bank. And my horse went down to the belly, and I gave him a kick, and he just got up. And I'm the guy back of me wouldn't come. So then those guys had to go down like 100 yards to get a better crossing. And so there's just so many things that were, you know, when you do this reenacting, which I don't do, but I just, I suited up for three days, and it was an experience of a lifetime. And boy, was I sore at night. <laughs> was I sore? I would wake up with the Charlie horses. Oh, my God, I'm telling you. One thing on Dalbrin, the, the family was really bitter about the whole Dalbrin incident for, for the rest of their lives. Uh, he, he, uh, they, they were bitter because they claimed he did not plan to kill Jeff Davis, and they were bitter about the treatment of the body, as you point out in your book and as you pointed out here a lot. And uh, in the 1890s, just before her death, uh, Mrs. Madeline Dalgren, who was the second wife, uh, came to Greencastle and gave a uh, speech at the dedication of a water fountain in the town square. And a lady that we knew, Miss Ada Philippi, she was a history teacher. Uh, she was just, I don't know, five or six years old at this, and she read a poem. But the interesting thing is, and you can read this in the newspaper, as part of Mrs. Dahlgren's speech at this dedication, she spoke, uh, alluded to something to the effect of those evil people, those people who would denigrate his memory. So it was still with them, this, this uh, bitterness. Um, but uh, uh, well, when his father wanted to get his effects back, he considered the gold ring a relic, and that's why he wanted it back. It was a relic of his son. And um, Mrs. Dahlgren's uh, papers are at Georgetown in the Special Collections, Georgetown University. And there's a, in the papers there, there's a, an account where she received back his saber from a priest. Mrs. Dahlgren was Catholic, and he got it through the confessional. And he has, of course, the vow is you can't tell who, you, who the person is that gave him the, the saber. 
and she wanted to know, but he wouldn't tell her. But she got back the saber uh, through the confessional, which is really, I thought, an interesting story. Uh, but yeah, right, they didn't think that he was, but everything I could put together when I looked at personality and the way he acted and, you know, he considered himself a holy warrior. Kilpatrick's personality was such that, I don't want to make any political connections of today, but he was the kind of guy that would want to frog march Jeff Davis in front of Abraham Lincoln, you know? He would not want to have killed him. He just, that was not his personality. You know, he's a showboater. But Dahlgren, there was something in his personality, as the way I read it, that he would have no problem with killing Davis. And I think that I have circumstantial evidence that maybe Stanton and Dahlgren, you know, maybe cooked this thing up with the murder. And then one, one uh, final question. Um, did you uh, make any attempt to contact the, uh, the descendants of uh, uh, Martin uh, Roberts, Robinson or Robertson? I did, well, I did ask around, and I did go and, um, and look at uh, census records for free blacks that are in the uh, State Library of Virginia, and I couldn't nail down that part of it. What, what gave me the indication of Robinson was, Roberson, was that I found this pension record from a, a lieutenant, and he was the one that was saved, and then there was a post-war account that tied uh, Roberson in with Dover Plantation and the whole thing of helping a union guy. And it, it's all in that one chapter. But I thought I kind of tied it up versus what other people wrote about him. Just, you know, there's one account where Dogren just rode down through Guchin and found a guy building up a stone wall and said, get me across the river. You know, that, that, that's not what happened. And I, and, I, and I have enough staff officer reports of this guy, although they don't name him, but they give an indication that he had just helped an officer get through the lines and pretty good, pretty good stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, we have about uh, 20, 25 minutes to uh, take questions from the audience. Uh, please wait for the, uh, for the microphone to come around to you. We are recording today, so we got to make sure that we get your voice on the, uh, on the recording. So do we have, have anybody to open it up right here in front? In the publicity for this event, uh, it's, uh, it's listed as the murder of Ulrich Dahlgren. Any reason for this to be considered a murder as opposed to, uh, you know, conflict, combatants? I didn't do that, so I don't know. <laughs> That, that was my folks that uh, did that. Sorry if there was any... Uh, I, any uh, I, I only go by the title of the book. <laughs> so, kill Jeff Davis. Uh, thank you for the talk. Very interesting. I am looking forward to reading the book. Is there uh, any accounts how they were going to move all these prisoners? What kind of condition are they in? Are they going to be able to walk, ride any distance? That is a great question. Because the answer is no. There was no plans of what to do that I was able to find. They, were just, they just said they're going to free the prisoners. How they were going to get guys that were emaciated, starving to death, uh, you know, just in shattered clothes, how they were going to get them down the peninsula, nobody wanted to think about that. We just want to get this raid, you know, so let's get our name in a paper. And so there was none. Now, when Butler attacked Richmond, he had very specific orders that one regiment would go and grab Davis, another regiment would free the prisoners at Libby, and they would, uh, and they mentioned uh, gathering together as many carts and wagons as they could, bring them to a central location, and take the most disabled in those carts and wagons. Kilpatrick bro brought no any kind of wagon with him. The only thing they brought were several ambulances that they filled with explosives and extra ammunition. That's what they, the ambulances were for. So no, these poor guys, I, it would have been a slaughter if they had been successful. So it's good he wasn't successful, I guess, in a way. One right back here. 
Yeah, uh, could you go into a little bit more detail about the rest of uh, Kilpatrick's life and his rest of his career? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, immediately after the raid in April, in fact, that's how I start the book out. April 17th, he's leaving his, um, his headquarters in uh, Culpeper County, Rose Hill, and he's riding to Brandy Station. He's going to take a train. He's been assigned to General Sherman out west. He is going to fight under Sherman in the Atlanta campaign. He will be wounded in the Atlanta campaign, I think, at Resaca. He will command Sherman's cavalry in the march to the sea and up through the Carolinas. At the end of the war in March, about, I think it's in March of 65, he is promoted to Major General. Uh, he does not continue in the Army. He uses his political connections to become Minister to Chile. And he is down there in, right after the war, 66, 68. Major Cook is with him. Major Cook will die because his body is so racked by having been in Libby prison. Uh, Kilpatrick will come back. In the 1870s, he will be on the lecture circuit. And I found one source where he earns $20,000 a year uh, as a lecturer on the Civil War and on politics. And he will switch parties, whatever is useful to him. He will run for governor of New Jersey. He will go back to Chile in 1880. He will die in 1881 in Chile. They'll have a massive funeral for him. He, the first time he's in Chile, he will marry the niece of the uh, Archbishop of Santiago, very prestigious family that he marries into. And that's where the Anderson Cooper eventually comes to be. And uh, he will die in Chile at, in his early, mid-40s, uh, of Bright's disease, which is an inflammation of the uh, kidneys, I believe. Uh, has nothing to do with STD. I know a lot of people like to, you know, claim that Kilpatrick had this great life. I was not able to find a lot of good stuff on that. It would have made a better biography if I did, but a lot of it is overblown and not true. And so uh, he'll die, and he's buried at West Point. Uh, Bruce, if we might, before we take the next question, uh, you re shared with us your experiences as a reenactor. Would you tell us about General Kilpatrick's contributions as a reenactor? Yes, when he's back in New Jersey, um, 18, trying to say, 1876, 78, something like that. He has a farm in New Jersey, northern New Jersey, Sussex County, I believe it is. He will have the first Civil War reenactment. He will get McClellan to give him the New Jersey National Guard. He will get veterans to come in. They have like 30,000 people to send on this small town, on this farm. And I wrote, that was my first article I ever wrote. And the title of it was, Plenty of beer, but little to eat at Camp Kilpatrick. And he, sta and he staged all of these uh, mock battles and everything on his farm. And uh, the farm is still there. Yeah. Thank you. I have not read the book yet and probably will buy it on the way out of here. Sounds but, great to me. <laughs> yep. A question about the artillery use. You mentioned that there was an, an artillery battery uh, attached mm -hmm. for this raid, but You've never mentioned that they fired a shot or even that the cannon made it close to Richmond. Okay, uh, that's a good question, and I can't fit everything in. But yes, it was uh, Ransom's battery. I believe it was uh, Battery C of the 3rd U.S. Artillery. And they went with Kilpatrick. No guns went with Dahlgren. He unlimbered them when he got to Richmond, probably around noontime. They started throwing shots into... Uh, the Confederate fortifications, uh, while Kilpatrick and Davies and a few of the officers had lunch. I have a, a, a source on that. And uh, he had um, Custer's band with him. Custer had a brigade band from the Michigan Brigade, and the band was playing patriotic songs while the artillery was uh, firing shots at the Confederates, but it, they, it was virtually, didn't do any good. Just, but they did fire, they did fire. Uh, and, and I think there is an image of that on one of the, like the Harpers or something, like one of those uh, contemporary newspapers. There's a, his battery, but yes. 
Uh, could you give a little bit more detail uh, on Dahlgren's body when it was left, taken to Richmond, you said it was inappropriately displayed or something, and then the Northern Papers picked up on it. And also, when we take students to uh, Antietam Staff Rides, we always go to Turner's Gap, and there's a Dahlgren Chapel there. And could you, has that got any tie-in? Uh, you know, and I know that's post-war, but is there any tie-in to the family and everything else? Yeah, let me answer that one first. Uh, the chapel was built by Mrs. Dahlgren, and I believe it was to honor her first husband and her son, her, first, her son by that husband. But it's called the Dahlgren Chapel because she paid for it. Um, I don't believe that it was put up uh, for Ulrich Dahlgren. Do you? I don't think it was, uh, but uh, there's a re right across the road is a restaurant, South Mountain Inn. That was known as the Mountain House back then. <clears throat> it was used during the Civil War as headquarters by a number of commanders at different times. But she bought that. That was her mountain retreat. But she, as Bruce said, she was Catholic, and uh, there were no Catholic churches nearby. So she had that built so she'd have a place to worship right across the road from her summer home. Mm. Now, in terms of the body, when he shot, uh, he lays there overnight, and they, at first they were just going to throw some dirt on his body there in King and Queen County. Uh, one of the surrendered soldiers asked that they could do some, put him in a casket. And I, I got some detail in the book about this. Uh, they build a wooden coffin, they put him in the coffin, and they ship him to Richmond. Now there's some... Uh, Sources talk about he was displayed nude or something at the railroad station. I don't believe that's true. Uh, I, I think he did have some type of clothes on. Um, from there, Jefferson Davis ordered him to be secretly buried at Oakwood Cemetery. And that was done. But one of the slaves that was with that burial deep par party was coerced. I, don't, I shouldn't say coerced. I don't know for sure. He betrayed the information to Liz Van Loop. And Liz Van Lu went and dug the body up from Oakwood, put it in a wagon, put peach saplings over the casket, and they changed the casket from wood to uh, metal. They put it in a metal uh, casket, and they brought it out to near Hungry Station. And they buried it supposedly on property associated with a man named Oric. Now, Oric was a Union sympathizer, and it stayed near Hungry Station um, until it was dug up after the war. It might have been October. It was dug up and sent back to, but it might have been July. I'd have to go back and check. Uh, and it was sent back to Admiral Dahlgren. And there's a full military funeral. I believe General Meade might have been at the funeral and uh, uh, ranking officers and like that. And he's buried in Laurel Cemetery there's a Mount Laurel Cemetery, the Laurel, Laurel Cemetery uh, in Philadelphia. And, and Bruce, uh, would you talk about why the Southerners initially removed the prosthesis from his leg? You told us how it was eventually recovered, but uh, it wasn't an act of uh, just defiling the body. Would you no, actually, there was a doctor in King and Queen County that thought it would be something that the Confederate authorities, the Confederate Medical Department could use as a uh, sort of a template for future uh, prosthesis. And that was his intent, so he saved that. Somehow, Lieutenant Pollard, who was uh, at the ambush site, became a custodian of it. He was wounded at Yellow Tavern and lost his leg and was going to use it, but it did not fit him. And I go into some detail about this. He brought the prosthesis to Ballard, and the agreement was that Ballard would pay for a prosthesis for Pollard, and he would take Dahlgren's prosthesis and wear it. And that was, and he was wearing it when the, uh, when the federal authorities caught up to him. And I could never find out whether he made good on his pledge to buy Pollard a, a leg or not so but it's very it's and it's all in national archives it was an amazing find and i don't know if any of you know mike music 
But Mike was just, when he was there, he was just wonderful to people who were doing Civil War research. And he popped this file on my desk one day. I was there on a Saturday. I opened up all sorts of stuff on Dahlgren. Uh, amazing. It, it, under staff officer reports, I believe. Staff officer file. All sorts of good stuff about Dahlgren. I have not read your book, so I'm asking this to but see. You bought it, though. Yes. So I, That's the first step. I haven't had, I haven't had time. Uh, have you touched on anything in here about an alleged question being asked by Lee at Appomattox of Grant if the orders were legitimate? I cannot identify a source, but I've read this somewhere that Lee actually, when he was with Grant, asked about this. Do you know anything about that? That's the first time I've heard that. Okay, well, I wish I could find the source. Yeah, I wish so, so too. That'd be, that'd be great, yeah. Sure online. Yeah. Well, don't you have in there where uh, Lee contacts Meade? Uh, yes. And says what's going on here, you know, trying to find out what... Meade right, is. but that would be like mid-March. Uh -huh. That's before, really, there's a connection with Grant. And, of course, in the end of February 1864, Grant's headquarters are in Nashville, Tennessee. He has nothing to do with, with the raid. So unless he just looked into the matter himself uh, or heard something secondhand, he wouldn't be in a position uh, to, not in, not at the time of the raid. Well, the other thing is about the orders, if you do, I don't know if you know this, but in November of 1865, Edwin Stanton, like going to the library, goes to the War Department, checks out the orders, you know, the original orders were captured that the Confederate authorities had. They went to the War Department, they were put in a file. He checks them out, and there's no record that they were ever brought back. Very, very circumstantial, uh, intriguing type of uh, scenario. You actually just answered my question, so I have to think of something else That's quickly. <laughs> But isn't that cool? I mean, really, that he would check those orders out. And, and, and he was also involved with promoting. You know, I can't get into everything when I give a 45-minute lecture, but he was involved in promoting Dahlgren. They thought he was going to die in August of 1863 when they had the amputation because it was so severe. So they promoted him from captain to colonel without a command. And, and uh, Stanton was involved in doing that. And then here he comes and takes the orders that were found on Dahlgren's body. Do you have any further insights on why something like that would have been put in writing to begin with? And, and what Kilpatrick actually knew or, or didn't know about those orders? I think, and I'll defer to Dick and, and, and Ted, I think that orders are always written down when you have something like this going on. I think the question is why... When the, when the raid went south, when they were in King and Queen County and they only had 70 bullets left, why didn't they destroy the orders? Why didn't he? And that gets back to his ego. And that's what I try to point out. Now, Bartley, the signal officer with Dahlgren, will destroy all the codes and his maps that he had with him, the codes for the uh, shooting up the rockets. They didn't want the Confederates to know that. So he destroys that. But Dahlgren keeps those papers on him. It just doesn't make any sense. Uh, am I right? Don't, mostly, wouldn't they be given written orders yes, for the most part? And particularly since Dahlgren, at least if we can judge by his activity in the Gettysburg campaign, had this affinity for what we call today special ops. He, he's on his Greencastle forays, which were greatly exaggerated, but yeah. nonetheless, he was working with uh, Sharp and his intelligence apparatus. And, right. Uh, you'd think someone that was involved in special ops, that's the first thing they mm. do. But he's young. He, he's young. And, 21. Wow. You know. Remember when you were 21? Mm. Yeah, but I, I, I'd like to follow up on this, and I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, Ted, uh, to ask each of you what you think is the significance of the military intelligence that Dahlgren secured 
by capturing the Confederate courier in, in Greencastle. Uh, how, you, you had some uh, reservations about how important it, it was, but perhaps the three of us could very briefly speak with you. Mine was because the decision had already been made to stay at Gettysburg uh, by the Council of War. So it was irrelevant. And, and, and that's correct. I concur. What happened, is, you know, with Gettysburg, people like to have all this myth. You know, people just love all this, to have various myths about Gettysburg. And that became one of them. They, to, they blew up the importance of that, and that changed the course of the battle. But it, it, it didn't. It was spectacular. You know, that, that's the main thing. It was kind of spectacular, 35 miles behind Union yeah. lines and behind Confederate and, lines. And, and both of you make excellent points in, in, this, uh, in these regards. And what you recount from the tactical perspective, here in the Army War College community, we tend to uh, look at war, including the history of war, in the, the broader strategic context. And so what is this, this message? Remember, when Lee is already heading north, he writes to the War Department and urges them to order General Beauregard to come up to Culpeper with a few <clears throat> brigades and that Beauregard's reputation is so great that it will be creating an army in effigy which will uh, mislead federal planners the way George S. Patton's ghost army supposedly threatening the, the Pas de Calais deceived the, the German planners uh, that uh, Eisenhower was going ashore in Normandy. And the War Department replies, General Cooper, the adjutant general, uh, well, this is a great idea, General Lee, if you had told us uh, about this earlier, perhaps we could have done something. But at this stage, we can't provide any more troops. We cannot provide any more troops. Meade receives authoritative word from the Confederate War Department that there are no more troops coming to Lee. What Lee has is what he's got right there on the field. And tactically, yes. Meade has already made his decision to stay, and that's a great act of moral courage on Meade's part. But to have this strategic intelligence that there are no more Confederate forces in the Eastern Theater posing a threat is a tremendous coup. Yes, it is. Uh, for, and, and Dahlgren deserves uh, credit for obtaining it and Meade for, for recognizing its, its significance. So in that strategic context, I think it's a great, great military uh, I importance, and at the same time agreeing with you completely that in the tactical sense, Meade has already made the decision to stand and fight a third day at, at Gettysburg. The Gettysburg, what I'm, my point was, the Gettysburg legend makers then take over and make it a critical part of the battle, as if that helped win the battle. And perhaps it helped win the campaign. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have time for one more question. I do want to remind everybody after this question is over, we've got about 15 minutes before the gift shop uh, closes. If you were looking to uh, purchase one of the books before uh, the end of the day, we will stay here until 5 o'clock, though, uh, to chat, uh, discuss further, uh, and, of course, have your book signed. So we have time for one more question right here. Uh, well, perhaps... Perhaps a two-part question. First of all, how do you separate the stories from what you would consider fact? And then also, as time elapses from the events, uh, it would seem it would be more difficult to ascertain facts. Uh, although, the prospect is that we could discover new facts. So could you comment on those two aspects of writing history? Well, my focus was to, and, and I, I alluded to the soldier letters, because the soldier letters are written immediately after the incident. So they should be the most credible. The diary entries should be very credible. 
as you get further and further from the event, things tend to be maybe embellished. We would use those type of stories with caveats. And I did include some of them in the book when I had no other information available. But where I had, where I had more contemporary sources, that's where I would use the you know, pretty much definitive uh, you know, the, the reports, the official record reports and like that. When we get out into the memoirs, like that Sally said in uh, Blackberry Wine, that was written 40 years after the event and the fellow was not on the raid anywhere near Goochland, okay? So even though a lot of people believe it, when I went back and figured out what he said and figured out how... O Mrs. Seddon says to Dahlgren, oh, I know that name. I was a beau of your father's when I was in finishing school. So I went back and figured out how old she was, how old she would have been in finishing school, and figured out that Admiral Dahlgren, well, at the time he was, I think, a captain, but he was 37 years old. I don't think he would have been her beau. And so you, know, you try to put those things together. So the further away from an incident, the less credibility it would have, but sometimes that may be the only thing you have to use. Thank you very much, uh, Bruce, and thanks very much Thank to you. the panel. Thank Have a round of applause for them. Thank you. Thank you.